Our next speaker is Yuav Aadsi. Yuav is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Cornell Tech at Cornell University. Yuav has done some interesting work in vision and language, especially language-grounded navigation and spatial reasoning. We look forward to hearing from you. Okay, I think that's working. So, good afternoon everyone, I'm the last talk, so happy end of day for everyone, except the panel, I guess. Uh, this is gonna be a, a relatively high level talk about uh, three challenges that we, uh, in my group, have uh, been uh, finding interesting in the last uh, roughly uh, two years. And mostly I'm going to guide this with uh, several kind of like very high level questions. And the, the first one I wanna start with is really abstract, is like, why is language? And, uh, why me as an NLP person is a, in a workshop in a CVPR and why there are actually uh, quite a few, I mean, I think dozens, maybe even a hundred papers with language in the title in CVPR. And there are many reasons underlying this interest in, uh, in language and division community. Uh, one way to explain it, which I, which I particularly favor, is that uh, language is a way to uh, outline basically uh, interesting visual reasoning processes. And once we become very good at more basic uh, visual problem, like a cognition, we want to think at the taking the problem at a higher level, and language is a great way to do it. It's kind of like it's a program in, in, in to, uh, to, to specify uh, computations. And it's, very, and it's very accessible, so we can easily get annotations from it. People use it all the time, and it's also very expressive. It's arguably captures all the way in which we talk about what we observe in the environment. However, the diversity of the reasoning that we get from language really relies on the diversity of the language that we have in our data. And this is something that we, we has been getting increasing amount of attention in two years, and it can be divided into two directions, into two, uh, two problems, implicit biases in the data set and relatively simple language in this data set. And I'm using VQA here as an example, but this is something that's been repeating in many language and vision data sets and actually motivated a lot of follow-up work on improving VQA in, a later, in its later transformations. But, but very roughly, the implicit biases mean that we noticed as we've been studying this data set and our models have been performing better and better, that each of the modalities is a, is a backdoor to different types of biases. And our models are really, really good at capturing these biases and performing and giving us what looks like high performance but without really understanding the problem. And that's frustrating. We also noticed that the, although we, we came to language, I mean, it's, I'm saying it as a kind of like with a vision hat on, we came to language to get this like really expressive and complex reasoning process, the language that we get in our data is relatively simple and lacks diversity. So the first question that I want to ask is how, how do we stress test our methods? How do we create resources that really capture the full diversity of language, that take advantage of this new modality that we bring in? And we're not the only one asking this question. So uh, in the last few years, there have been a, a number of, uh, a number of uh, resources being created specifically for this goal. Uh, Clever came in around 2017, I think, from Johnson et al., where you have synthetic images and synthetic questions about them. Uh, that are, that, and the questions are generated to be highly compositional, so very deep uh, nesting. Uh, GQA is coming up, uh, it was just talked about uh, earlier today, and it's published in CVPR this year. Uh, similar to, Vic, to, to Clever, it has synthetic language, but the, but the, but the language, the vision now is going to be, is, uh, is realistic. These are, uh, if I remember correctly, Cocoa images. Uh, and around the same time as Clever, as Clever came about, we uh, released a natural language visual reasoning, NLVR, which similar to Clever has uh, synthetic images, but uh, with a somewhat different structure and presents a, a bit of a task that is a bit different given a, a statement that is natural language. So we crowdsource uh, this data. Uh, you have to say if the statement is true or false with regard to the image. 
NLVR isolates uh, or tries to isolate as much as possible the compositional reasoning problem. So it abstracts away a lot of problems. So it has a very small vocabulary, only 260 to token types. It only has a handful of objects and properties that it's, that it's, it's in included into the data set. And it has this box structure that encourages set reasoning in comparison between the different parts of the images. It's a very controlled environment. It's generated in a very specific way to target very specific phenomena. And this, and this generation process also allows us to create this compare and contrast uh, annotation task that allows to create balanced data. So every natural language example in NLVR is paired with images with different labels. And these images are designed to be very close to one another. So for example, these two images have exactly the same set of objects. They're just distributed differently between these, these uh, three different boxes. But NLVR is synthetic, and while it has certain advantages in isolating certain problems, it also uh, leads to a very limited lexical diversity and abstracts away a lot of the most interesting uh, vis uh, visual problems. So we asked ourselves, how can we uh, generate this type of data to real images? where we have no control of image content, we don't have this box structure that, that uh, encourages uh, set reasoning, and we can't generate images for this compare and contrast task that allows us to generate this balanced data. So what we did is we created the NLVR2, uh, or Natural Language Visual Reasoning for Real this time, uh, where we have pairs of images and statements about them, and the goal is similar to say if the statement is true or false. So for example, here the statement is one image shows exactly uh, two brown acorns in back-to-back -back caps on green foliage, and in this case, the image is false. NLVR2 creates uh, much of the setup of NLVR, but with real web images. Uh, it, it uses natural language data that is crowdsourced from workers. It had the paired images that, that uh, we have are analogous to the box structure, so they are aimed for a, this set comparison that we had in NLVR. And we have a compare and contrast uh, annotation task to create this balanced data. So just like in NLVR, we in NLVR2, we also have each, each, not each sentence paired with multiple examples with different labels. And this is really helpful in uh, overcoming and avoiding biases in the language, where certain, lang certain sentences tend to be uh, more inclined to be true or false, but because we have this uh, balance in the data, you cannot use this kind of biases in order to perform better. For our data collection, we created a, a whole new set of web images. So we scraped a new set, a, a new set of web images using a Google search, Google search. Our goal was to get interesting images. So we, we defined a set of criteria, and we had a crowdsourcing process to prune them. For example, we wanted images that contain sets of objects. These images are aligned to 124 scene sets from ImageNet. So you can still use all your tools and models that we have trained and, and refined over the years on ImageNet. In total, the data contains uh, 107,000 uh, uh, examples with uh, f almost 30,000 sentences uh, and uh, almost 130,000 unique images. It's split into training uh, and uh, development and test sets. And for the development test sets, we collected uh, more annotations. So we actually have, a re we are much more confident in the annotations there. It's a much higher quality. And this also allows to compute uh, agreement, which is uh, near perfect for this data. The average sentence length is uh, almost 15 tokens, and this, is, this, this uh, uh, illustrates the complexity of the reasoning that the writing task required from the annotators, and the vocabulary size is much larger than what we saw in NLVR, as expected when you work with natural images. So from 260 uh, token types in NLVR, now we have around 7,500 uh, token types. Uh, we did analysis to understand the reasoning challenges that NLVR2 proposes, and we compared it to NLVR, VQA, and the most recent uh, GQA. What we did is we sampled examples from each of these data sets, and we annotated them according to a number of categories. Here I'm showing a subset of these categories. Uh, in, a in a nutshell, what uh, I want to take away from here is that NLVR and NLVR2 are roughly equivalent, maybe with some, uh, with some tough differences for hard cardinality, and both of them show much more representation of the, dif of the different phenomena compared to VQA and GQA. And uh, the numbers here, what they mean is basically the, the, the estimated percentage of examples that contain this phenomena. And I'll show you some examples. So soft cardinality is something that we see in over 20% of the examples in both NLVR and NLVR2, significantly more than we observed in VQA and GQA. 
So for example, here, uh, the, the, the sentence includes the constraints, uh, and the other image contains a group of at least eight vultures. And you really need to reason about this constraint in order to understand that the bottom example has, is false, but the top example is where you have this like flock of vultures uh, on, the, on the left image is true. Negation is something that we also see uh, in, in, uh, significantly in NLVR and NLVR2, roughly 10% of the data. Uh, in this example, one dog sled team is moving and one is not. And you really have to understand that the dogs that, the dogs that are uh, at, uh, in the left image on the top, they're just kind of like lazing about between runs uh, and not moving in order to understand that this pair is true. The final example is this is universal quantification. In this case, we actually see much more in NLVR2 even in comparison to NLVR, and also in comparison to VQA and GQA. GQA in this case does have representation of this phenomena. So in this example, all the chairs have backs. Now, if you look at the, if you look at the two examples here, uh, the, for the bottom one, you can see that there are, ch there are a bunch of chairs in the left image, but and there are a bunch of chairs on the right image. In the right image, there are stools, so they don't have backs. So this quantifier uh, condition fails. For evaluation, uh, we have two metrics. We have accuracy, of, uh, the binary classification task, and we also have consistency, which measures the proportion of unique sentences for which the predictions are correct for all the paired images. So we actually want to see some kind of generalization across multiple examples for each sentence. And in the paper, we have a, a number of baselines. Here, I just want to show a, some state-of-the-art visual reasoning approaches that have been performing extremely well and clever, and a, some of the discrepancy that, they, that they, we see with the, regard to results in NLVR. A, the majority class is roughly 51.4%, and none of them really, a, none of these approaches get much, uh, much above a, the state-of-the-art. Even though the, the results on Clever are extremely high, with uh, the MacAnt having from these three the, the highest results. Of course, this is very far from our estimates of human performance, which are at 96% accuracy. So this is NLVR2, and, and now I'm going to switch to the next questions. And the next question uh, starts here. So this is Times Square, uh, arguably one of the uh, messiest no, uh, and busiest, and personally, I believe the uh, annoying, most annoying parts of one of the messiest, uh, busiest, and really nice cities of the world, uh, which is New York. Uh, and what I, when I look at this in the context of thinking about this in a, in, a, in, a, in a computer vision context, what I see here is that this kind of visual input is really different than anything that we see in most of our resources. And, but it's much closer to what we see in day-to-day -day life. In day-to-day -day life, I mean, this is arguably an extreme example, but we function and move around in these environments. So the next question is like, what kind of reasoning will we get if we use real-life observations? So what we did in our attempt to answer these questions is we created a large-scale navigation environment, a visual navigation environment, using Google's 3D panoramas of a large part of downtown and midtown Manhattan. Uh, this environment includes 30,000 panoramas connected with 60,000 edges between them, so an agent can look around in a panorama and can jump between panoramas to move around. And we defined a data, and for data collection, we defined a task where we asked people to write instructions to follow a path and then find an object that they hide at the, at the, at the goal position. And we, what we used is a touchdown, the Cornell mascot, and this hence also the name of the data set. We find that this really focused task makes the instruction writing much more clear to the writers and we get really high quality data. It also allows us very simple validation and it to create an incentive structure. So we ha just have followers follow the instructions to find the bear so, they have the so we know when they completed the task exactly. And once they find the bear, we give bonus both to the original writer and, and the follower. So everybody is really incentivized to write instructions that are clear, not too verbose, and just write to complete this task. Using this process, we collected uh, over 9,000 examples, and, and this is uh, one example from this, from this data. Uh, the, what you see, the point of view, this is what the agent sees, this like, first-person view of a, of a street view. And uh, it follows instructions. In this case, uh, orient yourself. So, I guess the video, of course, is not working. Let's try now. 
Yes. Uh, orient yourself so the umbrella to the, to the right, so it's moved and the umbrella on the right. Now it's going straight to take the right at the first intersection, so it's going to get to the first intersection, and then it's going to pan right and, and move to the next one, uh, until in the next intersection it will see an old-fashioned store to the left, so this is this bar that we see here on the left. There is a, also a dinosaur mural to the right, and at that point you have to take the cursor and find touchdown, which is described at the back of the dinosaur. So this, is this, so this is the task the, mod, the system has to do. And given this formulation, we can think of multiple tasks. So we can do navigation only. So given an instruction and a starting point, go to the goal, follow the instructions to go to the goal position. We can do spatial, spatial description resolution, uh, or SDR. Giving a sentence and a panorama, uh, just find the location of a touchdown. Or you can do the complete task. Navigate, get to the point, and then find the bear. And similar to NLVR, uh, we really like to do this kind of analysis, pick a bunch of categories, dive into the data. Uh, we picked a number of uh, examples in Touchdown, and we compared to Room to Room. room for those not familiar with, Room to Room is probably the most related data set. It's a panorama-based navigation uh, data set, very similar to our environment, but of indoor environments. And each environment is like many separate small environments. And what we are seeing here uh, is the number of instances, the mean number of instances per uh, instruction paragraph that we see for each example. And across the board that you see in the, in the real life uh, environment in Touchdown, you see significantly higher representation of this uh, interesting phenomena, a lot of spatial relations, both allocentric and egocentric, uh, state verifications, temporal conditions, a lot of references to entities. So I'm just going to briefly, uh, show, briefly show you, uh, just discuss very quickly uh, some baseline of the SDR task. For the navigation task, I'll leave it uh, for, the, for the paper and the poster we present on first day. So for SDR, we have uh, three metrics for evaluation. We have accuracy. We have consistency, very similar, to NL, very similar to NLVR, because we actually propagate the annotations of the touchdown location to multiple panoramas. So you can t t test consistency there. And we can also test uh, the mean distance there. And these are uh, some, uh, some of the initial results that we had uh, for non-learning non baselines of random and average performance is extremely low. text to con uses a, a, a convolutions that are created from an RNN output, and this performs much better than the baselines. And finally, uh, Lingonet, which is uh, our uh, uh, language condition, the uh, unit architecture, which we have designed for spatial reasoning, uh, performs significantly better. And, but it still leaves a lot, to, a lot to be desired, and I think, I think this, this example of a failure is a very illustrative of a, the, kind of a, the kind of mistakes that you see the system doing. So in this case, the SDR is there is a black doorway with red brick to the right of it and green brick to the left of it. It has light just above the doorway, and on that light is where you find a touchdown. So if you zoom in on this panorama, this is in the West Village, you can see in red, this is the, this is the gold labeled a location of touchdown, and they say green shade is this kind of a probability distribution that Lingonet uh, estimates for where the location of touchdown. And if you see where we actually put the majority of the distribution, is we, we actually do put it on doors and on light above doors. This kind of like architecture is very common in the village, but we miss the more uh, complex uh, constraints about the walls that are surrounding the door. So. Um, I hope you, so this is a, so this is touchdown. I hope you will come uh, to see the poster on uh, on first day uh, at the, the three twenty uh, poster session. Okay. The last question that uh, you now, so we talked about real life observations. Another aspect of realism, especially when we talk about navigation and interactive agents, is what happens when we think about realistic agents. And specifically, uh, thinking about what, what's, wh how do we ground, go from instruction and visual observation to continuous control of, re of realistic agents, for example, a quadcopter uh, drone. So this is a task that we, we've been working on uh, that uh, we published about in, uh, in Coral uh, last year. Uh, so in this, in this scenario, you ha we have a quadcopter drone that, uh, has, that sees the word for this uh, first person of observation, this RGB input, and gets instruction like uh, go between the mushroom, flower, chair, and tree all the way up to the phone booth and has to, uh, oh, video is not, ah, and has to uh, follow this instruction until it goes to uh, the goal position and when it gets to the goal position, it has to, uh, it has to come to a, to a halt and say it's completed the instruction. 
So very roughly, the task is to uh, take a natural language instruction and pose estimates, first person view RGB input that continuously uh, changes, and output two numbers, two velocities, a forward velocity and an angular velocity. We have, the, the environment is partially observable, and as you, as you fly through the environment, you're going to observe more and more of it. And there is this really large gap between the uh, instructions that are very high level and what is the output that you are going to get at the end. It's like basically the output of this, of this model has to be these like two real numbers that are continuously changed over time. So what we do to uh, uh, bridge this gap, we built a single new, uh, large neural network model that uh, you can divide into a number of, a number of reasoning tasks. It starts by uh, extracting, uh, by doing extraction, projection, and accumulation to build a semantic map of the environment that is completely, uh, that contains a learned representation for every position in the environment. This semantic map is then grounded using the instruction for a grounding map that focuses on what is mentioned in the instruction. And finally, using the, using the LingoNet architecture, we, predict, we, we use these two maps to predict two distributions. One that tells us what positions we are likely to visit in the environment uh, wh wh while, we are move, while we are flying through, and one that tells us where we are likely to stop. And these are all maps that are completely interpretable. We can superimpose them on, on, on the environment and see exactly how, how, the, how the agent interprets its, each of the objects in the environment, what it is focusing on, and finally, what is the plan, its plan for execution. So where it's planning to fly through and where roughly it's going to stop. Given these two distributions, we have a relatively simple uh, control problem that uh, doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, see the language at all at this point or the raw observations. So we just take this distribution, we transform them to the agent perspective, so they're always centered and in the same direction around where the agent is, and then we use a fully connected uh, neural network to basically predict uh, these two uh, real values. And these are some of the some of the results that we had. We compared here to a, a, a Chaplotel, which is a more like a, kind of like more black box neural network method uh, that was de designed for wisdom. Uh, on this data set, it gets about 20% uh, accuracy. Our previous work from a, a, a previous paper that uh, uses only the mapping procedure, not uh, all, the, all, all the planning that was on top of it, gets almost 25% uh, accuracy. And finally, once we add uh, this explicit mapping, uh, we, we get over 40% accuracy. And something that is very interesting, and, and I, I, I particularly like the difference between the red bar and the, and the orange bar, is the orange bar, we, usually, we originally developed it for synthetic language, where it was performing extremely well. But once we got to natural language, which is much more complicated, this explicit planning became extremely important. Okay, so now what we are doing now is we are actually taking these models and we are uh, moving them into a physical uh, drone in a, in, a, in, a, in a robotics lab where we have this cage that recreates the same uh, environment and we are transferring all these models to this uh, much more complicated Intel Aero drone. However, even if you don't have this physical setup, you can download it, our simulators and our entire framework from, a, from this URL. DRIFT stands for Dynamic Robot Instruction Following, and you can work on this environment uh, without uh, being, uh, you know, without the hassle of all this uh, physical stuff. Okay, so uh, I talked about uh, reasoning diversity, real life observations, and realistic agents, each uh, aligned with a, a framework and uh, resources we created. I want to thank the students that uh, actually have been doing all the hard work Elaine and Stephanie for NLVR, uh, Howard for a uh, touchdown. I don't know if he's around here, but he's in the conference. He's back there, and he presented on first day. He's also going on the PhD. He's going to look for a PhD next year. So <laughs> keep your eyes open. And finally, uh, Vals that work on uh, on the drone projects. So thank you very much. And if there is time, I guess I'll take questions. Any questions? Yeah. Well, I mean, so, 
So we do, we, I, th I think we have more than objects. I don't know, at least the results on, uh, on like the different versions of VQA and, uh, show that, I mean, it's, it's not as quantifiable as it is when we were working on ImageNet. It was so well defined and we could see the precision on different categories. But we, we are able to get above it. Uh, I think that, I don't know, my guess on, my, my guess on LVR2 is that uh, on, for these data sets, we have to think about more than just training from scratch on these, on, these, uh, on, on, the, on these data sets, how we can bring external resource on the problem. And something that, that's been, uh, uh, in NLP at least, that's been kind of like all the rage in the last uh, year or so is like pre-trained representations. Uh, maybe this is something that will help in, in a vision as well. It helped with ImageNet. Maybe we need to think about representations that are more high level. But it's, but it's, it's a hard problem. I do know that some people are adventurous enough and working on it. So hopefully we'll see some stuff soon. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Now let's move to the panel discussion phase. So I would like to invite all the panel members to come to the stage and be seated.